I'm very grateful and excited to introduce our keynote speaker, who's going to be David Brooke. He's actually very highly recommended. He came to us from other local chambers who have worked with him and seen him speak. So we're very excited. And he really is going to talk to us about a message of success through the power of living a life with gratitude. You may have seen him on King 5. He's been uh, appearing in quite a lot of our local media. And he actually has uh, several books, including the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal, the Amazon International bestseller, Ready, Aim, Captivate. And I'm sure, we, I think we've got a few of those up there as well. So after David speaks, if you're interested or would like some more information, uh, we'll be happy to provide that for you. So again, David, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Christy, and thank you so much, uh, everybody, for being here this morning. I'd like to start off with a uh, quick question. How many here have suffered a significant personal loss in their life? By show of hands. Everywhere, thank you. Everywhere I go, 10 to 20 people up to a couple of thousand. It's always about 80 to 90 percent of the room. And it doesn't have to be a person. In this economy and different things, people have lost houses and jobs and careers. There's all sorts of really significant losses. And when we talk about the theme of self-improvement and gratitude and how are you going to cope with some of those things. So let me tell you about my loss, at least the biggest one. September 29th, 1998, it was a Tuesday. I woke up, I looked over in bed, and my wife wasn't there. I thought, that's funny, where, where, where Dana is. And just then, Connor, my four-year-old, comes walking in, where's mommy? I said, I don't know, let's go down, we went down the hall, looked in a couple of the rooms. Then Kyle, my 14-year-old, gets up, where's mom? I don't know, and then we both, all three of us, we look downstairs and she's down in front of the washer and dryer and she's face down and she's kind of curled up and, and do, it doesn't look really good. So we go rushing down there, I turn her over, she's got all the stuff coming out of her mouth and things and Connor starts crying, I, still, I said to Kyle, go up and call the police, call the fire, call medics, get them here as quick as you can. And uh, I started doing CPR and got this stuff and, and, I, and I, tr I tried to move her where I could get to and do the chest compressions and all that stuff that I remembered from Red Cross training and within a matter of minutes, there's probably 15 to 25 people in our house. We're just teaming with all these, these uh, emergency personnel. Well, back to the people that have gone through significant things. Anybody that's gone through something like this knows that one of the things that happens is time loses all measure. You completely lose track of time. And I didn't think much time had gone by. And they have her on the floor and there's wires and paddles and just like you see on those emergency room shows. But it all seems so surreal because I thought, what is going on here? And this little short fire person comes over to me and she says, Mr. Brooke, we've been working on your wife for 90 minutes. We still don't have a heartbeat. Would you like us to continue? I remember at that very moment thinking, never before in my life had I made a life and death decision. And I said, no, you can stop. Because even when you're in shock, shock is the, our body's way of trying to protect us, the brain is still going to make some decent decisions along the way. And I knew that she had passed on. And what made it so challenging for me, it wasn't just that. That was 15 years ago in a couple of months. My father, suicide, very prominent attorney here in Seattle. My mother, cancer. We talked about it during the, the exercise, these influential people in our lives. Mine by far was my mother, died of cancer. Two of my best friends, Queen Anne High School, died in the night we graduated, crashed on Dexter. Vietnam friends. One of my fraternity brothers, Lou Gehrig's disease. It just went on and on and on. And as I've said many times, I actually will do this. I'm just skin and flesh and bones. And even though we're all mostly in black and white here in Seattle, as Christy said, she's right. It's supposed to be slimming. Um, I thought, I don't think I can do this. I really don't think I can do it. Within a couple of days after Dana had passed away, I walked upstairs and we had this little deck in the back and I looked out in the deck and some of the numbness of shock had worn off after 72 hours. And I looked up at the sky and I thought to myself, now I see why people kill themselves. I get it, I don't think I can do this. And somewhere along the line, I'm gonna have to figure out what I'm gonna do. And I just kept thinking, it'll come to me, but I gotta stick around and I can't go kill myself. I got two little boys that I gotta raise and I'm gonna to have to be strong. But I really realized that not only had I lost all that, but because of what had happened to Dana, she was addicted to prescription medication. And we'd met at Nordstrom and she got hooked on this Vicodin crap, excuse me, Oxycontin, all these names you hear about, it's horrible. And that's what had killed her. And I thought, I'm not gonna do that stuff and I'm not gonna go, my buddies, my fraternity brothers say, we're surprised you're not living under a bridge somewhere with a bottle after somebody, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to raise those little boys. So, but I kept thinking, I'm going to find something and I'll get to what I found in a minute, which of course is gratitude. But because of all those other losses, 
I kept thinking sometimes you just got to put one foot in front of the other, just sort of move one day to the next. But it does come down to one thing, and you have to decide. Now, you could do whatever you want in your life, but I went in to see this Dr. Dickinson about six months before Dana passed away. She was in addiction recovery three different times. And he said, uh, you Mr. Brooke, come on in. We need to talk about your wife. And they point to the room. And again, I always know depending on the size of the group, people have gone through this. It's not pretty. And they say, there's an attorney, there's a doctor. They make you feel better because there's these people that are addicted to these things. Well, you feel bad, but guess who you feel the worst for? It's your child, it's your son, it's your daughter, it's your wife in my case. And he says, I just need to let you know what you're up against. I've been doing this for 35 years. It was probably 60 or something. One in 20 will make it back to a normal life. That's it. And of the 19 that don't, half of them will be dead in the next six months. And she died about six months later. So I realized it depends a lot how you look at things. And you're going to have to decide. And you meaning any of us in this room or anywhere I speak. So I'd like you to just do a little brief exercise. I know we've already had one exercise. But if everybody could just please stand up. And I'd like you to just take kind of a good stretch and take your right arm and start turning it in the clockwise direction. Now, for those that may be clock challenged, there's a clock over there. <laughs> and so this is clockwise. And keep it going. Keep a nice stretch. Now, don't cheat and make it go counterclockwise. Now, start bringing it down, keeping it clockwise. Bringing it down to about your head, your eyes, your chin, now your chest. And now bring it down to your waist. Now what direction is it going? Counterclockwise. Ooh. Okay, you can sit down. Thank you. Now there's always, John, thank you. There's always one or two people that are going like this. I don't remember changing direction. I really don't. But it just is an illustration of it depends on how you want to look at something. And I chose to look at this. I was talking to Brian, wonderful gentleman. He said he had to leave, I know, but congratulations on his new position here at Antioch. But it depends on how you want to look at something. He and I were talking about his legislature experience and being positive or being negative. And I've always been a positive guy. But boy, I'll tell you, all those deaths, and especially Dana's, and listening to Connor cry uncontrollably, uncontrollably for just days at a time, it would seem like hours, what have you, that was challenging. But I realized that think about a time in your life when you, had, you came to a crossroads and what did you do? And again, and I'll get to the gratitude journal in a second, but we've all been there. I don't care if you're young or old. And you have to decide what tools do you use. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the whole business community because I know this is a chamber. And I always like to talk about how it ties into business, and I'll get into that in a second. But the thing is, is you have to decide what are you going to use. And it's back to that thing. If you want to lose weight, drink some water, do some push-ups, whatever it might You need some, some tools out there. But I also realized something else, too is it takes as long as it takes. I'm 63 years old. I know you're thinking he does look a little younger. 62 maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been through a lot. And I kept thinking, you know, what, what, what was the way I was going to, how was I going to make this? Or how was I going to do it? And I thought, you know, Colonel Sanders didn't start Kentucky Fried Chicken until like 62. <laughs> he looked a little older, 62. But there's all these heroes of mine, Sylvester Stallone, 300 banks to get uh, Rocky financing, Disney, Walt Disney, you had to go to tons of people to get money for Disneyland and didn't give up. So you have to decide and it takes as long as it takes. So whether you're 13, 53, 63, whatever, it really takes as long as it takes and you have to have that philosophy. We live in this high tech and, and uh, I think Christy mentioned it, South Lake Union, oh my goodness, is there a more high tech area? Well, there's all these Bill Gates and Bezos and all these heroes of ours. Some of these guys were in their 20s when they said, well, that's, you know, that's good for them, but that may not be you guys. It may not be me. It's, it's our time is when it comes. So you think about, again, what you did to face the challenges that you had. And think about, again, those challenges. And what happened with me is I realized, and I'm just going to tell you one quick story about Connor. It's really, it was about not giving up. And so Connor, about six months after Dana died, was diagnosed as uh, cha developmentally challenged, I believe was the term. And so I go in there, we need to assess him. He's in kindergarten. His mother has died six months earlier. And they go through all these tests. It's about seven or eight hours worth of tests. And at the end, they put Connor over here, and I sit down, and they tell me all this stuff. And we were living by Green Lake at the time. And they, they said, well, he's got all sorts of problems. He's need occupational therapy, and they had a list this long. I said, his mother just died six months ago. And they go, well, that's fine. And I said, you know, I was a decent athlete, Mr. Basketball Player. And I, thought, I said, he's going to be the quarterback at Roosevelt High School. And she starts laughing. He literally starts laughing. He's not going to be any quarterback. He's not going to play sports. I'm not even sure he's going to make it through school. 
And I just remember sitting there, you're kidding me. This is somebody who's assessing a four and a half, five year old son, child. So I walk out to the car and do the only thing that seemed natural. I burst into tears and couldn't stop crying for about a half hour. As I drove him, Daddy, what's wrong? I kept asking me about that. But you know what? I don't think he could play sports. I started him off in coach pitch and he had a tough time and then t-ball. Now I ask you, how many people here have kids? Again, significant chunk. How do you miss the ball when it's on a tee? <laughs> I mean, Connor, come on. The ball is sitting right here and he hits the tee. And I go, no, he adjusts a little higher. Then he hits up here. No, the object's the white thing, the ball. But he kept sticking with it. He kept sticking with it. But every sport he played as he moved through Little League to the higher levels, he couldn't play. Couldn't catch, couldn't run, couldn't throw, couldn't hit. Struck out. Ball was pitched here. He'd be swinging here. It was really tough to watch. He'd run back into the dugout, put his face in the corner, just plant his face in there, just ball. Well, you're a parent. Again, I'll, I'll guarantee you there's many of you here that know this. I can't run out there and put my arms around him. He'd, he'd feel embarrassed in front of all his buddies. Well, we get to May 31st, 2005. It's about 9 or 10. And there's a game, and it's the bottom of the 7th, and the other team is up 7 to 6, and there's two out, and there's guys on 2nd and 3rd. I think, oh, I wonder who's coming up the bat. Oh, boy. <laughs> And it's Connor. And he comes out of the dugout and he's doing the practice swings like he knows how to hit, which he didn't. So he gets to the plate. So I do the only thing that seems natural to me. How about a walk? Uh, a hit by a pitch, perhaps? Ball one, ball two, strike one, strike two, full count. The next pitch comes in. He just rips it down the third baseline. Just inside the bag. Goes into left field. The guy from third comes in. The guy from second's rounding third. Here comes the guy. Here comes the ball. Here comes the catcher. They all crash to the plate. The catcher catches the ball. They all crash the other. The ball bounces out. They win the game eight to seven. He's standing on second. I'm in the stands. And the entire team runs out and gets them and puts them on their shoulders. And I couldn't talk for about a half hour. I had such a lump in my throat. And we got home. And I sat him down in the bed later. I finally got my voice back. And I said, you know, Connor, it was never about baseball. It was about that you never gave up. And whether it was losing your mother or fighting through this thing with baseball or anything else in, in your academic life where you had a tough time for a while, it was about not giving up. And today, he just graduated. He was a starting pitcher on the baseball team this year. So he figured it out, but he never gave up. And I think that's one of the reasons why this message of gratitude to me is so important. So I really realized, okay, I'm going to need some vehicle as I went through these steps. This buddy of mine says to me one day, you need to get a gratitude journal. What is a gratitude? Has anybody ever heard of a gratitude journal? Oh, actually more than I was. Has anybody heard of a, a journal? <laughs> For those that are left, has everybody seen a journal? <laughs> Barnes and Noble, anywhere. And, uh, but I hadn't heard of it, and a significant amount of people here had. So I got one. Now this happens to be mine, but I got one before I did my own. And uh, I did what a lot of people did. I ordered it on Amazon and it came. And, uh, whoops, and I uh, put it on the shelf and didn't touch it for three months, which is ridiculous. Why do we do that? We order books and then we just put them there. We don't read them. So, but I started writing it. And all of a sudden, I noticed these profound changes started happening. And when you start reframing and refocusing everything in your life that has to do with what you're grateful for, it puts a whole different spin on things. And it gives you a coping mechanism. And what happened with Dana with her situation was that's not only a negative coping mechanism, but that's a destructive one and frankly a deadly one. And this gentleman from Glee the other day just died. I and mean, there's so many people that are finding, trying to find ways to cope. And so you've got to find something that's going to work for you and you've got to find something that's going to be healthy. And what I figured out on this, there's a little quote in the front that says, if you think about it, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, it inspires you. But if you write about it, it empowers you but you have to write about it. This takes seven and a half minutes a day. Now it looks like everybody's in pretty good shape here, so I know you're all doing eight minute abs. <laughs> it's less time than that, by 30 seconds. I've timed it many times. But what I'd like to do, and I was thinking there might be a few more people today, so I wasn't gonna do this exercise, but, but I just wanna do this. This is a, something I do when there's smaller groups where I've got a shorter amount of time. I do workshops for two hours and different things. So there's different time frames. But I'd like to just take a poll. And you've got to be honest with me on this when we do this, because we're going to, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to think about something. One to 10 is what I do in the front page of this journal, is your daily number. 10 is the best day of your life or one of your best days of your life, and one is one you don't want to talk about. 
On those one days, your own goal, your only goal rather, may just be to get to tomorrow. That's it. Or get through today. In fact, somebody told me something three days ago. This is one of the best lines I've ever heard about good and bad days. Did you know what I do on good and bad days? And I said, no, tell me. I, this may work. And it was great. On the bad days, you want to get to bed early. And he goes, on the good days, you want to stay up late. And I, it's really true. When you've got a bad day going, you may just need to get to bed as quick as you can, get to tomorrow. But if you've got a good one going, of course, if the same day, the next day is a bad one, same goal. But if you've got a good one going, stay up late, get a lot done. Stay in a good mood, stay up till 10 or 12 or whatever it might be. But so, I want you all just to think about a second for your daily number. What is it, from one to 10? Now, to be safe with the audience, if you're between a one and a five, I don't want you to raise your hand, because that's not, I don't want to interfere in these people's lives. But I want to know how many people, when you think, so you, everybody got your number in your head? Okay, how many people are a six? Okay, a couple. How about a seven? Okay, a few more. How about an eight? Okay, again, nine? Couple, and how about a 10? One 10, fantastic. All right, now I normally do this with paper, but I knew again I was gonna have a little shorter amount of time today, I don't wanna run late. So here's what I like you to do. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds, and here's two, th two different things I want you to think about. I want you to think about the three things you are most grateful for in your life. Just plan them in your head. And I'll time in a second, I'll shut up. And I want you to think about what the highlight of your day was yesterday. Today's too early. Yesterday, what was the best thing that happened yesterday? So three things you're grateful for. You can write them down if you want, but I just, I really want you to get them in your head. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds starting now. Okay, time's up. And as I said, I normally, what I normally do is I have a reproduction of this page and I have people take about two or three minutes and write them down. But this is just as good. So you got them planted in your head. Three positive, three grateful things and, and hopefully in the right priority that you're the most grateful for and what the highlight of your day was. Now again, we don't have time for you guys to, I like to get some, some uh, feedback from the audience, but just think about that. Now, how many people are sixes now? One or two? How many sevens? Couple more. How many eights? Okay. And how many nines? Fantastic. And how many tens? Still just a couple. We gained a ten. All right. <laughs> no matter where I do that, there's always, and as I say, it's, it's usually a little better when you have something you can actually write down and it's very visceral. But it, all those numbers always improve dramatically. You always see a bunch more eights, nines, and tens by that very exercise. And that's the point that I wanted to make. And there's something about it. The CPU up here called our brain is where these thoughts originate. But they go to our heart. They go to our arm. They go to this very cool pen, which, by the way, check this out. It's like a makeup. <laughs> it is compostable, but I like getting my brows right. This is just like, I go, if that isn't a makeup brush, I don't know what is. It's cool. But it almost always improves. And that's, and that's where the difference is. So this is why I'm so passionate about this. I tell people, if you want to have a healthy coping mechanism, get a gratitude journal. I developed my own. It's called the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal, as Christy mentioned. But it's very, very cool. Day and date, your daily number, a couple of lines on your current events. I already was up early this morning for current events. I already wrote in it. going to speak to the South Lake Union Chamber today. Everything you're grateful for, the highlight of your day, and then your gratitude intentions on your right-hand side are really powerful. That's everything you're going to be grateful for before it's even happened very very powerful and it's amazing what the subconscious mind can do so if you get mine great I have them to sell but you can also get them on my website thebrooker.com but more importantly just get one and watch the difference it'll make such a big difference so now what I want to talk about is in the business community I managed Nordstrom stores for years I was a store manager for seven or eight years three different stores I used to manage Lowe's stores up until recently and I left this so I'm gonna do this full-time so I'm gonna make a difference and have a passion about something you can tell when people are really passionate about things but what I noticed in the business world is that there used to be well actually there was a survey Americans hate their jobs so all of you that run businesses I heard hotels and some other things here at the school and various places we all have these people called employees and they're not as engaged as they used to be if they ever were but this survey this is the most recent like a month ago 30 percent are engaged or inspired so less than a third 
They're actually in, engaged or in expi inspired, rather. 52% have a perpetual case of the Mondays. They're there, but they're not present. You know, we all know what a not present person is like, right? You're talking to them, they're looking over your shoulder, waving to somebody else. And I'm all, well, isn't that cool when you're at a party and then you're, and you want to go, after three people, you go, do you want to go talk to them? I mean, because clearly you're not interested in me. It's the same thing. They're there, but they're not present. 18% are actively disengaged <coughs> and they roam the business spreading discontent. <laughs> and of course, let's not get on into Facebook and how they do that as well now. But what's happened is that this is what I used to use when I was at Nordstrom, this particular survey. This is 19, it actually came out in 83, but I used it for a long time. The three top things employees wanted in an employer, appreciation and recognition, help with personal problems, and being in on the no. That was the top three. Now wages, benefits, all this other stuff was further down the list. Well, that's all changed now. A new survey came out a couple months ago, and I know appreciation and recognition is still part of it. But this is really important for all of you business owners or managers or directors or anybody who's managing people. Three is responsibility. Two is goals. Does anybody want to take a shot with the runaway number one thing is now for employees? Any ideas? You can shout it out. Can we get some more coffee in here? No. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, sir. That's actually a very good guess. Similar. Purpose. Everybody wants purpose now. So the new one, uh, just to be more current, compensation, transparency, open-mindedness, innovation, attention, flexibility, autonomy, responsibility, goals, and purpose. Well, if you want to give somebody their purpose, be grateful. But you better start with yourself. And that's the thing that I don't understand. Connor and Kyle are now 29 and 19. That was 15 years ago. I've never had a cigarette in my life. I don't understand people that smoke as parents. I better not see you doing this. And they're smoking away. It doesn't work. All those stores I managed for Nordstrom, I got all sorts of awards and at Lowe's and, and Jody said something about it. I was talking about my bio. She says, well, make sure you toot your own horn. You know, I, I guess to a point sometimes, but it was never that hard for me because it was the golden rule. I treated every employee just like I wanted to be treated myself. And I was a big star. I was flying on corporate jets and going to the owner's suite when they owned the Seahawks and all this fancy stuff. Big deal. I never started a sentence without... Will you do me a favor? Can you pick this stuff up here? Can you move that antioxidant? sign? I want to get over here. When you get a second, can you wrap up the food for me? And I got all those awards. Why? Because I was grateful for those people. And the important thing that gratitude did for me too, it, has never, it helped me to never lose the little boy enthusiasm I had when I was a kid. I'd ride around in those corporate jets and I'd oh man, this is the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> and then I'd be in the owner's suite and there was John Nordstrom talking, hey Dave, how about over here? Like, oh my God, this is like, I couldn't believe it. And we've all been around people that think they're cool. And when I do my workshop, I have little badges I give people that think they're a sheriff now. They're, they think they're cool. Everybody, you know, you talk, I don't do work. You do the work, I sit here and I just direct people. And even at Lowe's, I was once out picking up garbage in the parking lot. Somebody said, why are you wasting your time? I said, I gotta set a good example. I gotta be here early, I gotta pick up the garbage and all that kind of thing. So what happens when I've done workshop, which is really thrilling to me, is the kind of results that we get Higher retention rates, people are happier, having fun. <coughs> Lower turnover, increased engagement, decreased absenteeism. Boy, that's a good one. And my son who works at Costco, Connery's about to go off to college. Somebody says, I want you to, to come do something with me the other day. He says, I gotta work. He goes, just, just call in sick. He goes, I'm not calling in sick. I gotta work. I'm gonna be responsible. And improve productivity. And so that's what really happens is that by getting this, but you've got to set the example. The biggest thing I noticed, the number one question I got, and I'm sure all you people are managers, have been in management, could have had this kind of, why do people respect you? What's the best way to be a manager? Why are you, why do you get to be store manager of the year? All these, it all came down to one answer, same answer I had the entire career. You gotta set a good example. Same thing with your parents, being a parent rather, and the same thing with your employees. So that's what it really, that's what really makes a difference. And the best way to do that is to be grateful. You write in that gratitude journal, just you can see just the numbers right there. That's the difference it'll make because what happens is it reframes and it refocuses you into this positive mindset. And it's tough. Brian and I were talking about how negative it is out there. I do a video every single morning on gratitude. I've got over 300 now on YouTube. And I think 35,000 views or something like that. You know what people ask me all the time? Well, that, that's super. How do you come up with a new idea? I just start laughing. What is it, just like a finite amount of things you're grateful for? What happened to Dave Brooke? The video stopped, he ran out. 
<laughs> There's nothing more to be grateful for. It's so sad. He's sitting in the park. He ran out of ideas. I, I just, I don't understand it. So anyway, all right, listen, here's what I'd like to do real quick. I'd like to do a drawing, if we could, because I want to be respectful of time. And I can get carried away for a long time. So take out your business cards, if you would. I've got my cards there. If you have your own cards, I would prefer that. But you've also got business cards of mine. If you don't, you can write on. But here's what I'd like you to do. Every Monday morning at 7.45, I send out my featured video of the week. It's less than two minutes long, usually 1.45 to two minutes. If you want to get the video, great. If you don't, put an X on your card. Because I don't want anybody getting my video that doesn't want it. Because there's a lot of people that get a lot of stuff and they just, I can't get one more thing in my inbox. But we're going to draw for a, um, for a book. And then also, where's Josh? I have some flyers too that if you, oh perfect, thank you Christy. That just kind of explain what I do. I'm extremely grateful, as you can imagine, to people that refer me to other people. I got referred to South Lake Union Chamber from a couple other chambers. So anything that uh, businesses, companies, people always say, well, who do you speak to? And I speak to a lot of service organizations, but I speak to a lot of businesses too. So it's, it's a pretty universal message. And I do, as you can see on the flyer, I do workshops and various things too, which are a little more in depth for management teams about this whole aspect of how gratitude can change your life. So, um, all right, so let me, uh, 